Good, a- good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the first of our 2018 Lenten luncheons. Uh, by all accounts, this is uh, the 35th year that uh, we have been doing these, so uh, it continues, and great to see so many people here today. Uh, just a uh, quick rundown of uh, what's coming up. Uh, it's on the table on the uh, sheet, but next uh, week we have uh, Megan Schoenberg, who's the founder and coordinator of the Brockton Blessings in a Backpack program. It's a uh, program that uh, provides backpacks of food for uh, Brockton students uh, that are uh, food insecure that, uh, as many of you know, Brockton students, all Brockton students get lunch and uh, breakfast at the schools now. Uh, This gives those who are from food insecure families uh, food for over the weekends. Uh, They have partnered with us uh, for the last two years. We uh, supply them a lot of food through our food pantry from the Greater Boston Food Bank to help uh, fill the backpacks and uh, recently they have been doing all of their packaging next door at the Hilston Gym at the Fruit Center and uh, if you are on Facebook and check out the church's Facebook page, you'll see pictures from uh, last week's packaging event where they really have a lot of people come in and help and uh, make it a successful program. Uh, the following week, we will have our new Ward 4 counselor, Susan Nicastro, as uh, our uh, guest. Susan is uh, the Ward 4 counselor in which the church is. and. Uh, She's uh, moving right along and supporting the neighborhood, and uh, that should be a uh, interesting uh, lunch. The following week, you will have to listen to me, along with uh, Nicole Casper, the archivist from Stonehill. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, one of Brockton's uh, forgotten tragedies, the 1928 tragedy at Moosehead Lake in which nine prominent Brocktonians drowned. There was only one survivor. Uh, and uh, in May, Nicole and I have our book coming out, The Brockton Tragedy at Moosehead Lake. Uh, but you'll hear more about that on March 9th. On March 16th, we will have as our speaker Brockton Fire Department Chief Michael Williams. and. Uh, for the last of the luncheons this year, the Reverend Ann Deneen from St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Gloucester. She will be speaking on iconography. Uh, for those of you who don't know what an icon is, uh, there's one at the bottom of the poster. Uh, and this is a change from the original uh, speaker. Uh, we were having Reverend Paul Sinat, who uh, is also uh, an expert on Icon's going to speak. He works for the bishop's office, but he's having hip replacement surgery and a three-hour ride that soon would not be good for him, so he had to uh, back out for this year. So we have a good lineup, and hopefully uh, you will all join us. And uh, I will introduce our speaker, but I will also ask Pastor Jeff to come up and uh, say grace. We'll do grace first. and. Anything that Pastor has to say? Good afternoon, everybody. So good to see you today. Um, uh, Thumbs up for lunch. Good? So many thanks to the folks who prepared it. I'm excited about um, our season here for Lenten Luncheons. As always, bring a friend. Um, Where are you going to get this kind of food on a Friday afternoon? Homemade. Um, and lovingly homemade. I'm excited about our speakers today um, from, Stone, from Stonehill who are going to talk about something I'm passionate about, and that's, believe it or not, farming, <laughs> But because I like to eat the things that come from farms. So anyway, um, but first a word of grace. Gracious God, thank you for the food that we have just eaten, and remembering always that it comes from the the bounty of your creation, and and creation is so very important to all of us every day of our lives because we are indeed part of it, and we are stewards of that very thing. 
Bless the food that we have eaten to the nourishment of our bodies and keep us mindful and watchful of the needs of others. All this we ask through your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And uh, I'll introduce our speaker. I won't say a lot about her background on that. I'll let her do that so I don't cut into her presentation. But uh, we are happy to have with us today uh, Bridget Meggs, who's the manager of the farm at Stonehill. I think I first met uh, Bridget uh, four or five years ago at a Brockton Area Hunger Network meeting. Uh, the work they're doing over at Stonehill is uh, great, and she has uh, Cecilia, a student, with her today. So uh, please welcome Bridget from the farm at Stonehill. And we're going to put some of you in candlelight so you can see the screen better. <laughs> Thank you. So we use this one. Yeah, that's just pick up. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this amazing lunch. Thank you to everyone who prepared it. It was so delicious, and um, we're it's so nice to have lunch prepared for. Thank you. Um, and we are, I don't have a very formal presentation. I just wanted to give everyone an opportunity to learn a little bit about. Um, what we do at the farm at Stonehill. And I brought Celia with me because she is an avid farmer at Stonehill. We don't have a program in agriculture at Stonehill, but we have a very strong interest in food justice and food access. And we have a couple classes, so we managed to keep Celia um, where she's studying environmental science and um, business and um, working at the farm a number of summers. So. She's going to talk to you a little bit later about her experience working at the farm and how she got involved. Um, my background is kind of mixed um, in that I didn't think I would necessarily be a farmer when I started, when I, when I was younger. Um, I was really interested in wildlife conservation and then studied abroad in Africa in college and I learned more about food access issues and wanted to combine those interests as sort of thinking about environmental, taking care of our environment and also addressing human needs. So farming seemed like an important thing to do to think about um, where does our food come from and how is it grown and what kind of impact that has on people, what kind of impact that has on all the animals and um, the environment that sustains us. So um, I get to teach classes like sustainable agriculture and food justice with a colleague, Chris Wetzel at Stonehill, and um, I like farming because it, you're constantly learning. I don't think there's a point where you're done learning as a farmer, and I think you're definitely not done learning as a uh, teacher either, so apparently I like to keep learning. That's my goal. One of my goals in life is to remain curious and to keep learning. So I like to try to foster that environment for students at Stonehill, um, keep us asking questions and thinking about what's going on in the world, what's going on with the planet, what's going on with people and our needs. So the farm at Stonehill was started in 2011, um, seven years ago, to address food justice, food access issues in Brockton and Easton. So we predominantly grow everything to donate or sell um, below market costs at a mobile market. And this presentation, you can kind of see in this picture here, that's the farm at Stonehill with an aerial shot, um, and that's during July. So if you went to the farm today, you'd pretty much just see a big wet brown field. Um, but in July, it's got a million different colors. We sell flowers. Um, and the flowers also are good for bringing in the pollinators, so we're happy to have all of that happening. And then all of these pictures around the outside are of students who are passionate about and involved with the farm. So um, a lot of, we actually just had a big summit at Stonehill on the weekend. We had about 30 different schools come from all over the Northeast who have farms or want to have farms on their campuses. And the thing that was really amazing about that is we had about 130 people who were really excited about farms on campuses and what they can provide. And the one, one thing that I think differentiates us as a campus farm is that we're not necessarily growing food for the students to eat on campus and we're not growing um, food to sell retail to the community. Um, 
we are a living classroom where we do have classes, and but our mission is really to educate about food access and food justice. And so um, it was wonderful to hear from all these other college farmers and college students who were involved in these farms about why they had a campus farm and what sort of culture they were feeding with their farm. One of the women was from Middlebury College and she spoke about how they have a farm for meditation purposes. So to give these kind of really type A hardworking students a place where they can go and relax and connect to nature. So that was really wonderful to think about all the different roles that farms can play for students on our campuses. Um, either as a place to learn about sustainable agriculture or as a place to write a poem or um, just get some fresh air and get some dirt under your fingernails. So um, this is our mission and I actually don't, I have a video but I think I might just give that to Jim to share because I'm not sure what the sa if the sound would work to show that. Um, but we recently had a video done for the farm and if you go to our farm website you can see that um, but it is great because it shows the farm in this busy time of year in July and we talk about what we're doing with the farm. So as I said, there are many different things that a campus farm can do. Um, we end up being a living classroom, so a place where faculty and students can come and learn about a wide, wide range of um, topics. We also are a community partner, so we've done a lot of events where we're working to support community gardens in Brockton, um, working on growing food with students at Stonehill and then distributing it through our four community partners in the mobile market, and then inspiring students to think about where does my food come from, why does it matter, what are the impacts of growing food um, with chemicals as opposed to growing them organically, and why do I care about that? Why is that important? And so we, we just want people to start asking questions. Um, in these photos, you can see some of the people. So the picture on the bottom left is a bunch of students who are involved in Camp Shriver, which is a camp that happens every year at Stonehill. Um, it's a, a wonderful camp where um, students may or may not be um, on this, like on a spec, on the spectrum, or you know, they may, it's all very need blind, and all these students can come, and kids can come, and they can learn all about um, many things, including composting and worms and the farm, and um, have lots of activities. And they do that every summer at Stonehill, but we get to work with them every week, and they come over and help us pick beans and other things like that. Um, and then the student um, in the far um, right of the screen graduated a few years ago. It's Devin Ingersoll, and she actually was also a Stonehill Service Corps member um, and was really involved in food access issues as a student and now is working at the Greater Boston Food Bank to help um, get food from otherwise would have been wasted, get that to people because um, it's perfectly good and it can be uh, distributed to help with food access issues. So she definitely caught that food access bug and she's still working in that field. Um, and then in the middle photo are four or five students who helped harvest marigolds because one of the classes that I teach I teach with a, a professor in the Visual Performing Arts Department, Candace Smith Corby, and we combine art and environmental science and um, sustainability and use items grown at the farm to make dyes. So we use marigold petals to make a yellow dye and then did a dyeing project, so that's great. Um, so this is just a little bit more detail about the living classroom aspect. And you have we have more pictures of cute, happy kids helping to plant sunflowers that they started. With, um, that's a Camp Shriver group. They started the seeds, and then four, four weeks later, they planted them at the farm. Um, and then we also have those students again with the flowers, just sort of to point out the different age ranges we work with. Mostly Stonehill students, um, but then also some of the school groups from Brockton Public Schools in the summer comes with the, the summer meals program and camp and the parks program actually where there are meals provided and then Camp Shriver with all these wonderful kids and then helping with community gardens and um, offering workshops for how to grow vegetables in a sustainable manner. We So that's sort of that living classroom aspect and then we also have this sort of very strong mission-centered social justice component um, where we're really thinking about where does our food go and 
how does it get distributed? So we grow about 10 to 12,000 pounds of produce every year, and it goes mainly to my brother's keeper, the Houston Food Pantry, the table at Father Bill's in Main Spring, and then the David John Lewison Center of the Old Colony YMCA. And um, that basically for the first five years, it all went to those four partners, and now about two thirds of it goes to those four partners and a third of it goes to our mobile market. And so um, you can see that this happens mainly through the work of four, four or five students who work hard with me all summer, but we're also really dependent on volunteer efforts. So every year we have about 300 different people who put in about 700 hours of work to make the vegetables um, grow and be happy. So um, all of those students usually come on Friday afternoons and we have what we call Farm Fridays, and it kind of gets people interested and gets them involved. Um, and so just a little bit more about the mobile market itself. These are all pictures taken at the mobile market. Um, you can see we have some signs and some hardworking students, and these are some of our regular customers who come every week. And a lot of them are involved in different community health, with community health workers, with different programs focused on nutrition or you know healthy aging programs or knocking down diabetes programs and they partner and come with their community health workers so that they can um, have fresh vegetables as part of their diet and a lot of times buying them with vouchers that are provided by the community health workers um, we also accept cash and credit cards so please come see us if you'd like some fresh vegetables on Wednesdays in the summer the market goes from about June until the end of October and we're there Wednesdays. We're either at the, we alternate locations, either at the Campello High Rise or um, at the main Brockton Neighborhood Health Center right there on Legion Parkway. And so once we're in the season, it's on our, it'll be on our Facebook page when we're going to be at different locations. And we'd love it if you wanted to come and see us at the, at the market. Um, and we really like having those two locations because we want to make sure we can reach people who might you know, not have easy access to a grocery store. That's one of our main goals. So one of the other side things we end up doing with the farm is, you know, a lot of times students ask, especially if they're new to Stonehill, well, why don't we eat the vegetables that we grow at the farm? And what we try to do is then encourage those students to put pressure on our dining program to purchase from local farmers in the area. So we work closely with Langwater Farm. You might know them. They're on um, 138 in Easton. And there are a lot of other great farms in the area, like Freedom Food Farm down in Raynham. Um, and we, we want to figure out a way for our dining service to support those local farmers, because we want more local farms in our area. So student groups like Food Truth um, exist to put pressure on Stonehill's dining service, Sodexo, to purchase more of those local items. And then students also get excited about issues like composting and addressing food waste and um, having events around Earth Week, which last year turned into Earth, Earth Month. And there's a big push right now. A lot of the food, a lot of, there's a kind of a to-go culture at Stonehill. Students will order a meal and then take it out of the dining commons. Um, and they do that because they have a lot of work to do, but they're using disposable containers which then get thrown away. And so there's a big push right now to try to get students to learn about and use reusable containers. And so that's definitely something that can be connected to that idea of limiting food waste and that sort of thing. Um, so I actually brought Celia Dolan with me because I thought it would be fun for you to hear from a student about why they get involved with the farm, um, and her interest in how it's kind of affecting her education. So I'm gonna invite Celia to come up and speak about that and then we can take some questions at the end. We just have to hold it because it's a little shaky. Hi everyone, thanks for inviting us here. Um, <laughs> it's great to be with you all. So as Bridget mentioned, my name is Celia Dolan. I'm a junior environmental studies major with a business minor at Stonehill. And my freshman year, I started volunteering at the farm. Um, my orientation leader actually told me about the farm. I didn't know Stonehill had a farm when I started there. And he made it sound really fun. And I've always loved the outdoors. So I thought, hey, this would be a great way to get back outside and connect with nature. Um, and when I first started, it was kind of just a fun thing for me to do. I liked planting. I liked seeing the, the vegetation grow and how it became a plant that someone could eat. 
um, and Bridget was so welcoming and everyone there was really friendly. But as I kept working there, I saw how important food access issues are, which is something I never really thought about before. So I continued to get interested in food justice issues. Um, and I actually wanted to study agriculture, but as she mentioned, it's not a program. So I took it upon myself to try to educate myself. I've gone to some conferences, I've been reading books, um, and I actually started a garden at my own home for the first time this past summer, which was a lot of fun. And my parents have been very supportive. We got a compost bin for our kitchen. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. So last summer, I actually took a trip to Italy with Bridget for a class that was focused on farming and ag agriculture in Italy. Um, so it was interesting to see how different countries produce food in different ways and their sustainable focus. Um, and I also took a hope trip that was focused on sustainability. So I learned about growing food on a smaller scale and how those people produce their own food to eat themselves. It's very different um, in the industrial, industrial system where you produce food to go distribute to so many people and they don't have a real connection to the food they're eating, they don't know where it's coming from. And I know that's the case on Stonehill's campus as well. A lot of people don't always think about where their food is coming from. So I joined Food Truth last semester and I'm working as a food calculator. So we look at the food that our food company, Sodexo, orders and we see how local and sustainable it is and whether or not the food we're eating is real. And we're trying to connect with Sodexo and bring in more real food to campus. Um, so I think the farm has been really eye-opening for me. I never knew about food access issues, so I really want to thank Bridget for that. Um, I know she connects a lot of students with these things, and it's, it's something important for people to think about, and I think it's great that Stono has that resource available. So, yeah, that's pretty much it, but thank you all again. Um, so, we have just this one more slide, which actually I'm going to hand out to everyone. I have handouts, so um, we can pass these around. Um, but these are, do I pass them? Yeah. Um, this is sort of a, this is a poster that I made um, for a different conference. And the point was to show that even though we have this one farm where, you know, maybe one would think you have a farm, that must mean you have an agriculture program, that must mean that you grow food and you eat it at your, at your school, um, that we're actually, um, we have all these other, we have a central mission which really is focusing on food access and food education. Um, where is our food coming from? What, how does it impact the environment? And then how that kind of affects the campus culture. So there's a part that's called campus engagement and that shows all the areas where um, student, the, the, camp, the farm has inspired different things to change on the campus. And then community engagement talks about the different things that we do in Brockton and Easton. And then over on the academic engagement side, talking about the different classes that come and work at the farm and visit the farm and how we learn differently. So um, when I first started the farm, I, was, I had not been a farm manager and my boss said, um, Bridget, just grow vegetables. And I, I laughed I, inside because I thought, um, just grow vegetables? That sounds like a lot of work. But um, we did it, we grew vegetables, we grow vegetables, and um, we do all these other things because they're so interwoven in the social political issues. So um, very, I feel very lucky to work at Stonehill where I get to work with students like Celia and a whole bunch of other um, inspiring young people. So um, you're welcome to visit the farm during the growing season, we're always there. And um, we'd love to take questions if you have any questions. When we plant, when we choose, it kind of starts with the soil and the seeds. So when we choose our seeds, we choose seeds that are organic seeds, which means they are seeds from plants that were grown using organic methods. Um, the soil is really rich, has a whole bunch of really rich nutrients and micronutrients. Um, and we start everything with this wonderful mix from a little place up in Vermont that has this incredible mixture of 
nutrients. Um, and then when we are growing things, we don't use any chemical fertilizers or chemical pesticides. Um, everything is either compost, which comes from things breaking down at the farm itself, or from compost or soil that we buy from an, a place that doesn't use pesticides or herbicides or fungicides or anything that's derived chemically. Um, so organic, I think it just means it's coming from um, a process that is does that only involves these natural process of breaking down and decomposition. And so we can use things like manure or something like that, but we're not going to be using um, nitrogen from a chemical source. Um, do you teach composting? Composting? We teach composting? Hmm. Not really. <laughs> we don't teach composting. Composting. Well, there's two areas ways to answer that question. I think so. We do have composting in the dining commons at Stonehill, but where it's a constant education to tell people what they can actually compost. So we generally don't get a lot of great um, material from the commons because people don't understand what you can and can't compost. So there needs to be education there. And then um, at the farm, when we have groups of little kids that come, we always go out into the compost pile and dig around and find worms and talk about how it works. But we don't. Um, we don't have uh, workshops uh, about composting, um, but I know there's a lot of really great work being done with um, different master gardener programs, and if there was interest in there being a composting workshop in the city, I'm sure that um, there's a group of people working with community gardens in the city, Vivian, Centauri, and Paula Gomes, and they're affiliated with the Brockton's Promise Group, that they would be happy if they knew there was an interest to have some sort of workshop on compost, they could bring someone in to talk about that. What are some of the blocks? Here you go. Sure. <laughs> um, what are some of the crops? What are some of the crops? So, oops, sorry. Um, we have a variety of fruits and vegetables, mostly vegetables. We've had tomatoes of heirloom varieties, which means um, they're not genetically modified or anything like that. Um, we also have eggplants, cucumbers, um, let's see, lettuce, we have kale, potatoes, mm -hmm. um, all sorts of different varieties. Pretty much, how many, how many varieties of vegetables do you grow? I think it's like 39. 39, 39 almost 40 varieties. Um, mm -hmm. We also grow a lot of flowers, as Bridget mentioned, which helps with the pollinators. We have some herbs, like basil. Um, we have an herb garden as well, so we try to have a wide variety of things and not have a monoculture, which means you're just growing corn, for example, for acres and acres. We try to use it. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so this is just a little bit more detail about the living classroom aspect, and you have we have. More pictures of cute, happy kids helping to plant sunflowers that they started. With, um, that's a Camp Shriver group. They started the seeds, and then four, four weeks later, they planted them at the farm. Um, and then we also have those students, again, with the flowers, just sort of to point out the different age ranges we work with, mostly Stonehill students, um, but then also some of the school groups from Brockton Public Schools in the summer comes with the, the summer meals program. And camp and the parks program actually, where there are meals provided, and then Camp Shriver with all these wonderful kids, and then helping with community gardens and um, offering workshops for how to grow vegetables in a sustainable manner. We so that's sort of that living classroom aspect, and then we also have this sort of very strong mission-centered social justice component, um, where we're really thinking about where does our food go and how does it get distributed. So we grow about 10 to 12,000 pounds of produce every year, and it goes mainly to my brother's keeper, the Easton Food Pantry, the table at Father Bill's in Main Spring, and then the David John Lewison Center of the Old Colony YMCA. And um, that basically for the first five years, it all went to those four partners, and now about two thirds of it goes to those four partners, and a third of it goes to our mobile market. And so um, you can see that this happens mainly through the work of four, four or five students who work hard with me all summer, but we're also really dependent on volunteer efforts. So every year we have about 300 different people who put in about 700 hours of work to make the vegetables um, grow and be happy. So um, all of those students usually come on Friday afternoons and we have 
what we call Farm Fridays, and it kind of gets people interested and gets them involved. Um, and so just a little bit more about the mobile market itself. These are all pictures taken at the mobile market. Um, you can see we have some signs and some hardworking students, and these are some of our regular customers who come every week. And a lot of them are involved in different community health, with community health workers, with different programs focused on nutrition or you know healthy aging programs or knocking down diabetes programs. And they partner and come with their community health workers so that they can um, have fresh vegetables as part of their diet. And a lot of times buying them with vouchers that are provided by the community health workers. Um, we also accept cash and credit cards, so please come see us if you'd like some fresh vegetables on Wednesdays in the summer. The market goes from about June until the end of October, and we're there Wednesdays. We're either at the, we alternate locations, either at the Campello High Rise or um, at the main Brockton Neighborhood Health Center right there on Legion Parkway. And so once we're in the season, it's on our, it'll be on our Facebook page when we're going to be at different locations and we'd love it if you wanted to come and see us at the, at the market. Um, and we really like having those two locations because we want to make sure we can reach people who might you know, not have easy access to a grocery store. That's one of our main goals. So one of the other side things we end up doing with the farm is, you know, a lot of times students ask, especially if they're new to Stonehill, well, why don't we eat the vegetables that we grow at the farm? And what we try to do is then encourage those students to put pressure on our dining program to purchase from local farmers in the area. So we work closely with Langwater Farm. You might know them. They're on um, 138 in Easton. And there are a lot of other great farms in the area, like Freedom Food Farm down in Raynham. Um, and we, we want to figure out a way for our dining service to support those local farmers because we want more local farms in our area. So student groups like Food Truth um, exist to put pressure on Stonehill's dining service, Sodexo, to purchase more of those local items. And then students also get excited about issues like composting and addressing food waste and um, having events around Earth Week, which last year turned into Earth, Earth Month. And there's a big push right now. A lot of the food, a lot of, there's a kind of a to-go culture at Stonehill. Students will order a meal and then take it out of the dining commons. Um, and they do that because they have a lot of work to do, but they're using disposable containers which then get thrown away. And so there's a big push right now to try to get students to learn about and use reusable containers. And so that's definitely something that can be connected to that idea of limiting food waste and that sort of thing. Um, so I actually brought Celia Dolan with me because I thought it would be fun for you to hear from a student about why they get involved with the farm um, and her interest in how it's kind of affecting her education. So I'm gonna invite Celia to come up and speak about that and then we can take some questions at the end. You just have to hold it. Hi everyone, thanks for inviting us here. Um, <laughs> it's great to be with you all. So as Bridget mentioned, my name is Celia Dolan. I'm a junior environmental studies major with a business minor at Stonehill. And my freshman year, I started volunteering at the farm. Um, my orientation leader actually told me about the farm. I didn't know Stonehill had a farm when I started there and he made it sound really fun. And I've always loved the outdoors. So I thought, hey, this would be a great way to get back outside and connect with nature. Um, and when I first started, it was kind of just a fun thing for me to do. I liked planting, I liked seeing the, the vegetation grow and how it became a plant that someone could eat. Um, and Bridget was so welcoming and everyone there was really friendly. But as I kept working there, I saw how important food access issues are, which is something I never really thought about before. So I continued to get interested in food justice issues. Um, and I actually wanted to study agriculture, but as she mentioned, it's not a program, so I took it upon myself to try to educate myself. I've gone to some conferences, I've been reading books, um, and I actually started a garden at my own home for the first time this past summer, which was a lot of fun, and my parents have been very supportive. We got a compost bin for our kitchen, um, and it's been a lot of fun. So last summer, I actually took a trip to Italy with Bridget for a class that was focused on farming and ag agriculture in Italy. Um, so it was interesting to see how different countries produce food in different ways and their sustainable focus. Um, and I also took a hope trip that was focused on sustainability. 
So I learned about growing food on a smaller scale and how those people produce their own food to eat themselves. It's very different um, in the industrial, industrial system where you produce food to go distribute to so many people and they don't have a real connection to the food they're eating, they don't know where it's coming from. And I know that's the case on Stonehill's campus as well. A lot of people don't always think about where their food is coming from. So I joined Food Truth last semester and I'm working as a food calculator. So we look at the food that our food company, Sodexo, orders and we see how local and sustainable it is and whether or not the food we're eating is real. And we're trying to connect with Sodexo and bring in more real food to campus. Um, so I think the farm has been really eye-opening for me. I never knew about food access issues, so I really want to thank Bridget for that. Um, I know she connects a lot of students with these things, and it's, it's something important for people to think about, and I think it's great that Stono has that resource available. So yeah, that's pretty much it, but thank you all again. Um, so, we have just this one more slide, which actually I'm going to hand out to everyone. I have handouts, so um, we can pass these around. Um, but these are, do I pass these? Yeah. Um, this is sort of a, this is a poster that I made um, for a different conference. And the point was to show that even though we have this one farm where, you know, maybe one would think you have a farm, that must mean you have an agriculture program, that must mean that you grow food and you eat it at your, at your school, um, that we're actually, um, we have all these other, we have a central mission which really is focusing on food access and food education. Um, where is our food coming from? What, how does it impact the environment? And then how that kind of affects the campus culture. So there's a part that's called campus engagement and that shows all the areas where um, students, the, the farm has inspired different things to change on the campus. And then community engagement talks about the different things that we do in Brockton and Easton. And then over on the academic engagement side, talking about the different classes that come and work at the farm and visit the farm and how we learn differently. So. Um, when I first started the farm, I, was, I had not been a farm manager, and my boss said, um, Bridget, just grow vegetables. And I, I laughed I, inside because I thought, um, just grow vegetables? That sounds like a lot of work. But um, we did it. We grew vegetables. We grow vegetables, and um, we do all these other things because they're so interwoven in the social political issues. So. Um, very, I feel very lucky to work at Stonehill where I get to work with students like Celia and a whole bunch of other um, inspiring young people. So um, you're welcome to visit the farm during the growing season. We're always there. And um, we'd love to take questions if you have any questions. So I have one. Um, yeah. Can you um, what, what for Stonehill constitutes it being an organic process. If you could talk us through what does that mean? So we don't, when we plant, when we choose, it kind of starts with the soil and the seeds. So when we choose our seeds, we choose seeds that are organic seeds, which means they are seeds from plants that were grown using organic methods. Um, the soil is really rich, has a whole bunch of really rich nutrients and micronutrients. Um, and we start everything with this wonderful mix from a, a little place up in Vermont that has this incredible mixture of <coughs> nutrients. Um, and then when we are growing things, we don't use any chemical fertilizers or chemical pesticides. Um, everything is either compost, which comes from things breaking down at the farm itself, or from compost or soil that we buy from an, a place that doesn't use pesticides or herbicides or fungicides or anything that's derived chemically. Um, so organic, I think it just means it's coming from um, a process that is does that only involves these natural processes of breaking down and decomposition. And so we can use things like manure or something like that, but we're not going to be using um, nitrogen from a chemical source. Um, do you teach composting? Composting, we teach composting? Hmm. Not really. <laughs> we don't teach composting. Composting, well, there's two areas, ways to answer that question, I think. So we do have composting in the dining commons at Stonehill. 
but we're, it's a constant education to tell people what they can actually compost. So we generally don't get a lot of great uh, material from the commons because people don't understand what you can and can't compost. So there needs to be education there. And then um, at the farm, when we have groups of little kids that come, we always go out into the compost pile and dig around and find worms and talk about how it works. But we don't, um, we don't have you know, like workshops about composting. Um, but I know there's a lot of really great work being done with um, different master gardener programs. And if there was interest in there being a composting workshop in the city, I'm sure that um, there's a group of people working with community gardens in the city Vivian Centauri and Paula Gomes, and they're affiliated with the Brockton's Promise Group, that they would be happy if they knew there was an interest to have some sort of workshop on compost, they could bring someone in to talk about that. What are some of the talks? Can you answer? Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> what are some of the crops? What are some of the crops? So, oops, sorry. Uh -huh. um, we have a variety of fruits and vegetables, mostly vegetables. We've had tomatoes of heirloom varieties, which means um, they're not genetically modified or anything like that. Um, we also have eggplants, cucumbers, um, let's see, lettuce. We have kale, potatoes, mm -hmm. um, all sorts of different varieties. Pretty much, how many, how many varieties of vegetables do we grow? I think it's like 39. 39, 39 almost 40 varieties. Um, mm -hmm. We also grow a lot of flowers, as Bridget mentioned, which helps with pollinators. We have some herbs like basil. Um, we have an herb garden as well. So we try to have a wide variety of things and not have a monoculture, which means you're just growing corn, for example, for acres and acres. We try to use it. Yes, yes. Do you work with, around Brockton with the Haitian and Cambodian families who probably have a lot to teach us about agriculture because where they come from is probably their main, um, main way of surviving. And do you work with them? So, uh, my, my personal experience is more with uh, the market, like selling vegetables. Um, I think it would be awesome if there was a, I know that there's a garden, you know, there's different community gardens in the city, and if there was a big focus on there being one that was focused especially on working with um, people from Cape Verde and Haiti, and Haiti. Um, I, I don't personally, but I would love to. I mean, I think it would be amazing. There is a group of women who we worked with um, two years ago through the Brockton Neighborhood Health Center who are from um, Venezuela or Ecuador, Ecuador. And um, that was wonderful. That was over by the grocery store there. Um, blanking on the name, Vicente's, the new one. And there was an area there that was going to be at some point developed into maybe a place where a CVS would be or something. But that particular summer, nothing was there. So there was a group of committed women who grew a lot of vegetables um, right there, right next to the Neighborhood Health Center. Um, and then they were also involved with the Neighborhood Health Center in different sort of health-related programming. So that was really great. But um, I'm always open to new. I, and I think there would be, it would be great to sort of learn and then be also in turn learn what people would like to see at the market. You know, are there different vegetables we're not growing? We tried to do a survey. Um, we did a survey. But I'm, you know, and, and tried to, and worked with the community health workers to do some translations. So we're processing those surveys right now, and Celia is going to tell me if we need to grow anything else. Um, you have any problems with irrigation, like the dry spell of the summer, etc. So we, we don't have, um, the question was about if we have trouble with water and irrigation. We actually don't have any problems because we um, have a well that's really deep. It's about 400 feet down and our pressure is good. We did, last year when it was really dry, um, we had to water a little less regularly because the well was fine, but you know it's, it was stir being stirred up because it, the water was it was being pulled on too much by the system, so we went to watering during the dry period less because we didn't want to pull too much water. But um, we we're lucky because we use drip irrigation, which is um, basically we, we have um, a deep well, it comes up, it goes into a um, PVC pipe, and then it has all these little drip hoses that come off of it. And those, it's a great way to water that is water into contact 
takes into mind water con conservation and it only drips you know a certain rate every six inches right where the plant needs it so it's not um, being lost to evaporation so we only we don't really use overhead watering um, we also added a rainwater barrel catch we're looking for ways to integrate that for our watering system as well so it's a good way to recycle water from rain <laughs> 